Welcome to Empowering Plants, a show dedicated to identifying waste and undue expense in the health benefits industry, discovering ways to maximize benefits while minimizing costs, and empowering employers, administrators, and consultants to emphasize, once again, the benefit in Benefit Plan. Today's episode is brought to you by the FIA Group, empowering plans since 1999. Now here are your hosts, the FIA Group's own CEO, Adam Russo, and Senior Vice President and General Counsel, Ron Peck. And Brady. Hey, it's another episode of Empowering Plans. And who have we got here today on this podcast? It is the one and only president of the FIA Group States of America, <laughs> the one and only Brady Bizarro. Brady, how you doing? I'm well. How are you, Ron? I'm feeling strong today, everybody. So you have joined the FIA group. You're in the FIA family today. And what are we going to talk about? Well, what do all families talk about around the table? They talk about politics, right? Politics. And uh, we are actually recording a podcast outside the usual schedule with the specific purpose of dissecting some of the things we heard from the president of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, regarding, in particular, healthcare. But frankly, I'm going to open the uh, I'm going to open the conversation, the discussion up to anything you want, Brady, uh, as long as it's within <laughs> the what? How long was it? Like two hours? An hour it was, and a half? It was long. You know, yeah. uh, State of the Union address that we heard recently. You know, we listened. Yeah, I'm just speaking for myself, but I'm assuming you're the same, Brady. Listen, because as a citizen of this fine United States of America, you felt it was your your civil duty to listen to this uh, State of the Union address and and kind of see what's on the docket. How are we doing as a nation together? More importantly, how are all the uh, Democratic Congress people in the uh, in the room going to react to everything he says? And I'm going to give you some of that sarcastic clapping. There, there you go. go. Right? Yeah, That's I great. Awesome. <laughs> right in your face. You know, but also in particular, if you're like me. You were also listening to see whether they were going to talk anything about uh, healthcare in our industry. And, you know, go onto YouTube or wherever, folks, and, and, and go ahead and bring it up and find the point where they mention healthcare. And you'll notice it's almost dead center in the middle of the speech. So if you're one of those people who only listens for the first five minutes or one of those people who only really kind of tune in at the last five minutes, you're going to miss the most important part, which according to science, if I remember correctly, they say that you pay the most attention during the first 15 minutes and the last 15 minutes of a lecture or a speech. So that means that healthcare was brought up at the point when people were paying the least attention. And speaking of the middle, when people aren't paying any attention, Brady, it's your time to talk during the podcast. Uh, no, but seriously, what what did you think about what you heard? I think it's interesting this time because the speech itself was delayed until after the Super Bowl. And they say that the State of the Union is the political Super Bowl of the year um, because it is really a chance for the administration to lay out its agenda for the year. And for us, of course, healthcare being one sixth of the entire economy, you can bet it was going to be talked about. And I was listening, you know, I watched it like three times, let's be honest. But in doing so, I was careful to note um, wherever the president mentioned um, items that affect healthcare, our industry in particular. And there were many things that he talked about. Um, and I think he, like you said, Ron, he put this sort of in the middle of a speech, I think for a couple of reasons. One is which people do pay more attention. Um, in the middle. But also, I think there are a lot of items in the list of things he went through that have bipartisan support. And so to the extent he needed some extra clapping and you know applause from both sides of the aisle, he would get it. And so what I've done is I, I put together a little list here, and we'll just touch on these things briefly, because you know unfortunately we can't talk all day long, although I'd love to, um, about the top things in healthcare that the president mentioned, number one of which is prescription drug prices. So this is a topic that we've talked ad nauseum about um, there's been tons of rhetoric on it, but I think what you saw, what you heard rather, or both, in the State of the Union is actual plans, action plans of what the administration will do to try to tackle a problem that affects really almost every single American. Just while driving in here this morning, um, there was a story about the cost of insulin. It's just skyrocketed in the last five years. Um, the story cited from NPR that a patient with type 1 diabetes was paying about $2,800 in insulin um, for, in 2012. Today, that cost has risen over $6,000. So that's a huge difference. You have working class families who have, are being forced to choose between their insulin and food in some cases. And that's not right. So what has the administration done? What have they announced uh, in terms of plans to tackle this problem? Um, the first thing to note is that there's a bill that's been introduced by a Democratic senator 
um, who's running for president um, actually in 2020, which would permit Medicare, the largest purchaser of drugs, to negotiate prices with drug manufacturers. That's a bill that if it actually proceeds in the Congress, and it looks like it might, um, could be a game changer because it could, if it passes, um, and you start having negotiations on drug pricing, you could end up with a sort of drug pricing index like we have for, frankly, every other medical service. So you could see self-funded plans and PBMs and other entities that have an interest um, in, in knowing what drug prices are look to the Medicare-like rate for a certain drug. That could be a big deal. One of the effects of this bill would be that manufacturers that are not negotiating in good faith would be stripped of their patents to use a certain drug. So that would allow generic drug manufacturers or generic drugs to enter the market much sooner than they otherwise would, which would definitely lower the price. So those are two examples. Um, and that's not a bill, again, that the president has supported yet. But um, this is sort of he did talk about on the campaign trail, Medicare negotiate, uh, price negotiations. He talked about price transparency. And just last week, Johnson & Johnson announced they would be posting their prices um, in commercials on TV, which is a big deal. And so I think you heard a lot in that speech about drug pricing that I thought was interesting. So, you know, you've brought up a couple items that are really interesting to me as well. In one instance, you know, where you talk about Medicare coming in and negotiating rates and things like that, it's actually very interesting. Uh, I participated in a discussion down in D.C. with some uh, industry representatives. And, you know, it, it's funny because many, many years ago, I remember when reference-based pricing, in particular Medicare-based pricing, was becoming more and more of a hot topic. One of the things that I thought of that I thought was kind of out there and a little zany, but I threw it into an article, and I really got to find that article. I wrote it, I think it was like six years ago, um, about how one of my concerns about using Medicare as a reference for pricing was that it basically takes the power of determining what an appropriate payable amount is, and it's putting it into the hands of a government entity. Even if it's not technically Medicare, the fact that you're then using Medicare as your benchmark, that's still a certain reliance on, on the government for setting pricing. And what's interesting is, uh, even at that time, people started to kind of rumble a little bit about this idea of Medicare for all, or single payer. And I basically said, aren't you bringing us a little bit closer to that if Frankly, they're setting their prices for everyone anyway. Why not just have it just they're the payer for uh -huh. everyone? And what's interesting is recently that concern has actually popped up. So I'm starting to give myself a little bit of a pat on the back that where people are saying to me, they're saying, hey, you know, uh, one of the reasons why we're hesitant or people in our industry, entities in our industry are hesitant to really promote this idea of Medicare based pricing is because they don't want anyone to think that we as a private industry depend on Medicare for anything because if you create that uniform pricing based on Medicare, it's one step closer to Medicare for all. So when I hear now you know, the president and these proposals where they're saying, oh, hey, let Medicare do the negotiation, let Medicare set the prices, everyone pay Medicare rates, I'm thinking, ooh, you know, every time you say that, it's just one more hook that Medicare is kind of latching into private health care at what point does someone say, hey, you know what? If it looks like Medicare, tastes like Medicare, and pays what Medicare pays, isn't it just Medicare for all? And I know that's a bit of a reach, but at the same time, it is, I think, one step closer. So that's a, that's a concern I've heard, and, and it was an interesting one. Yeah, interesting. I think um, we could have a couple podcasts probably about the implications of Medicare for all, but that's certainly a lot of the rhetoric you've been hearing from- um, Book it, Pat. We're doing it. <laughs> we got it down. But but other other points of rhetoric I think that are worth mentioning is if you listen to the president's um, State of the Union speech and, and subsequent speeches or, or press releases that ha have been given by members of the administration, I think what they've done with regard to the ACA is they've taken a different approach in how they described the state of the ACA, if you will. And that is in Trump's speech, he mentioned, uh, of course, you know, took a victory lap for getting rid of the individual mandate in the ACA. Uh, but he also mentioned that it was extremely important for, to keep protections for those with pre-existing conditions. That's a point that's very popular with the public in the ACA. Um, I think Republicans now have pretty much all come on board in deciding or determining that they need legislation to protect those people. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's been a good thing for, uh, for the country, frankly. And I think both parties will come together to protect that piece of the ACA. So really, rather than dancing on the grave of the ACA, which is sort of was happening last year, now you see um, the president sort of already moved on and said, OK, like we're going to save the good parts of the ACA that people like. And he's sort of shifting his, his attention and the ire to price transparency. And I'll direct us, uh, our listeners to an earlier podcast we did about price transparency. 
Yeah. You know, Brady, it's funny. I feel like you and I, you know, we, we, we put the turd in the punch bowl. You know what I mean? It's we throw icy water on everybody's party and rain on the parade. When people are just, yeah, transparency, we're almost there, baby, transparency. And then you and I are, well, here are the, the things, the risks of transparency. Here are the things that need to, you know, need to be careful when you think about transparency. And we always are kind of slowing things down, pulling on the reins. And the same thing also when we talked about, and, and I know it was in a past uh, podcast as well, we talked a little bit about uh, the quote-unquote popular parts of the ACA versus the uh, parts that are not quite so popular. And basically, it's pretty simple to, to determine what's going to be popular and what's not. The things where you're receiving something or they're expanding coverage are popular, and the things where they expect you to do something or pay for something, that's not popular. Yeah. Okay. Surprise. You know, and if I remember correctly, I compared it to like a junior high school uh, student council election. You remember that? Where, you know, I do. Oh, we're going <laughs> to stop teaching math and have recess every period. Candy for all. Yeah, that you're going to win the election, but you're not going to be able to actually come through on your promises. What makes me laugh is basically what I'm hearing is, hey, look, we're going to make sure that there's expanded coverage. Everyone's getting all these wonderful things. Your health care is going to be paid for. But the portion where we actually tell Americans that they have to contribute money to this plan in order to pay for those things, eh, forget about that part. We'll find the money elsewhere. Where? Where? Where's the money coming from? You know what I mean? You talked about insulin. And diabetes, uh, particularly type 1 diabetes, right? Chronic disease. Uh, people often, you know, they'll confuse type 1, type 2, and then they'll say, well, that's a lifestyle disease. Get people on the treadmill. Okay, regardless of your stance on, on how preventable type 2 is or how to treat it, type 1, it's pretty much agreed. Uh, childhood disease, you get it. You end up taking insulin more or less for the rest of your life. So they're going to have to pay for it no matter how much exercising that kid does. So it's a chronic disease. It's a pre-existing condition. They're going to be covered by the plan. The cost of this insulin is going up. Where's the money coming from? Where's the money coming from? And that's the question I keep having to ask is, you know, I get that you want to make sure people have quote unquote health insurance, but there's this misconception that health insurance is equal to health care. It's not. Health insurance just means that somebody's going to open up the purse and pay for your health care. Who? Where's the money coming from? It's a simple question to ask, but it's not a simple question to answer. One other item that the president mentioned that I think I want to highlight on this podcast is paid family leave at the federal level. That's a big deal. And it's something that I think I was actually surprised he, he raised because he hadn't really talked about it since he's been elected. But it was an issue that's important to his daughter, Ivanka. It's an issue that's important for many Democrats. And I think Republicans are coming around and they've identified that uh, working families are struggling in this country and could benefit from, from such a policy. And for self-funded health plans, this could be a big deal because as everyone should know, uh, the FMLA as it is, is an unpaid leave. Um, that does not require employers to pay their employees, but it does continue health benefits. So any proposed legislation that would establish a federal paid family leave act would almost certainly also continue coverage. So it probably would go alongside the FMLA. But look, the the U.S. is one of the only developed countries in the in the entire world without a federal uh, paid family leave law, which is surprising. Um, many employers still offer this benefit. But if you established a, a federal law that required it, I think it'd go a long way, uh, frankly, to um, benefiting workers in the workplace. And I think it would also relieve some of the strain on working families. And so, for again, for health plans, how the bill looks and how it's formed, we'd have to have to not navigate in their handbooks and in other documents, you know, how the leave is um, administered, who's paying for it, like you said, Ron. In this case, I think it'd probably be split between the employer and the employee. Um, but this is, I think, a plan that might actually come to fruition in the, in the coming years, maybe before the end of this president's first term in office. There's already been uh, a senator who's important on many other issues in the healthcare industry, Bill Cassidy from Louisiana, who's announced that he's working directly with the White House to develop a plan that would be sustainable for employees and employers and would establish some kind of a, a fund that everyone pays into that would benefit both. So I think that was an issue that I, I noticed that he got a lot of applause for and I was waiting to see if he would bring it up again, and he did. So taken together, I mean, if you look at this list of priorities that he went through, I think you could actually almost ascribe them to a Democratic president, right? Prescription drug prices, price transparency and surprise billing, nationwide paid family leave, protections for those with preexisting conditions. That sounds like a Democratic platform to me, right? So I, that's why I picked these top items as ones that are likely to see action in the coming years because they really appeal across the board. You know, it is interesting you bring that up because I remember early, early in, in his presidency, you know, the drum that he, President Trump was beating on was, I'm going to crush the ACA. You know, we're going to take health care back in America. 
And you know, more or less having failed to do, I think, what he had hoped to do, it, it kind of became more, well, instead of fighting you, what we're going to do is let's agree on what we want to do with health care. And you're right. It kind of went from this complete anti-Obamacare stance to, OK, what can we do to make uh, Obamacare even better? So that's sort of the democratic approach. And I think what's replaced it is instead, you know, immigration and the wall and those things. That's that's kind of what you're hearing about now. That's that's sort of the uh, repeal and replace of 2019 is, you know, <laughs> the, is. The build the wall, um, you know. The, the last thing I want to bring up, and, and then we'll wrap it up, is as I hear more and more about these laws, particularly federal laws that are going to require employers to do this thing or that thing, one thing that it, it does actually sadden me a little is, and, and again, don't get me wrong, I, I you know being a father myself, the, the time I had to take care of my family during those early days was extremely important. And to be honest with you, I probably could not have focused on work even if I was forced to be here. Um, but I also recall during those days when my son was first born that this company, the Fiat Group, was extremely generous uh, in the time that it, it gave to me to spend time with my family, the fact that it continued to, to compensate me, even if all I was doing was occasionally checking my emails or answering a call on my cell phone, but more or less I wasn't working. Uh, and it was sort of this very informal but very flexible approach. And that's something that we extend to all of our employees. Uh, we have uh, m- a lot of young staff. Many of them are new parents. And across the board, you know, they need an extra week. You got it. You need to go home early. You got it. You need to come in late. No problem. And that's something that we do here voluntarily as an employer. And so that's something that, A, is seen as a benefit of working for the FIA group. And B, is something that we can actually promote when recruiting and hiring the best talent. And my concern is that any time government or anything else mandates that you provide those things, it goes from being a benefit and a privilege to being something that's basically just assumed. You know, it's just, it's a right. And so it's taken for granted. And I think that if you look at health insurance, that's one example, where employers that offer the best health plans, you know, that was a recruitment tool. That was a benefit of working there. And over the years, it's just become, I, you know, I just accept, I expect it. Right, right. yeah. And so I worry that these other things that more generous uh, employers have devised as ways to attract and maintain and keep talent Everybody has to do it by law. Those employers are now going to have to come up with something new to differentiate themselves. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's unfortunate. I think that that, that kind of uh, a sense of gratitude has become a sense of entitlement. And, and I fear this could just be one more way we see that. So just a thought. Yeah, I, I think what, the point you're making, Ron, underscores that um, whether you're talking about family leave or uh, a pricing index, that the government will step in and get involved when the private sector is not doing enough. And I think self-funding, um, we have an opportunity to sort of nudge the private sector in the right direction, show them you know, how you can be flexible, how you can tackle these problems on your own. Because let's face it, if the problems don't get tackled, um, the government will step in and do it Absolutely. for us. And that's what should worry us going forward. Yep. You know, Brady, good conversation, good assessment. I know there's a lot more to talk about. And hopefully, if people continue to listen into the podcast, we will do so. Vote with your ears, folks. So on behalf of myself, Ron Peck, my buddy over here to the right, Brady Bizarro. My buddy over here to the left, Pat the Man Santos, the greatest podcast producer in the world, world, world. You've been listening to the Empowering Plans podcast with the Fia Group. Thanks so much and enjoy your day. Thank you.